Good morning, everyone. I have never seen so many hugs in such a short period of time. Isn't that just lovely? So a really warm welcome, not that I need to wish you a warm welcome. There's so much warmth in the room. But my name is Dune McDonald, and I do wish you a very warm welcome to Teaching and Learning Week 2023. And as you can see, it's it's a beautifully set up for our auspicious start. To open, the University of Queensland acknowledges the traditional owners and their custodianship on the lands in which we meet. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. Teaching and Learning Week is an opportunity for the UQ community to learn from one another and creative and innovative teaching practices and to obviously enhance student learning and the broader student experience. As you know, our theme is synergy, chosen to represent the energy, collaboration and cohesion of the work we do to assist our students in their teaching, in, in their learning and their broader student experience. So during the week, we have 27 events with presenters from across UQ. The theme Synergy has a particular focus, as you also know, on UQ's newly revised graduate attributes mm -hmm. and the accompanying graduate statement and how they together can empower our students for its successful and unpredictable future. And I believe you've got a handout on your tables um, that may help you unpack um, the graduate attributes um, and that will be a helpful reference for you today and throughout the week. We hope you are able to attend the many valuable and, and no doubt engaging events this week and not only gain but share your important insights. Now, we are very honoured today to welcome Dr. Mary Graham, who is an adjunct associate professor in our School of Political Science and International Studies, teaching Aboriginal history, politics and comparative philosophy over many years. Mary is a Combermary person through her father's heritage and affili affiliated with the Waka Waka through her mother's people. Mary has lectured nationally on these subjects and developed and implemented curricular materials in Aboriginal perspectives, Aboriginal approach to knowledge, and at the postgraduate level, Aboriginal politics. Outside UQ, Mary has worked across several government agencies and community organisations and served as a regional councillor. I would now like to hand over to Dr Graham and we are so grateful you are willing to trust us with your knowledge. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, I, I just, I just talk. Oh, right. Okay. Okay. Oh, oh, good. All right. I see. You can, you can hear me. <laughs> um, well, um, thank you very much for inviting me to contribute today. Um, very appreciative of that. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge the uh, traditional uh, owners of this region, of these ancestral lands, um, the Turbal on the north and the um, Jaguar on the south. Um, uh, I'd like to, you know, um, acknowledge them uh, because I've lived up here and worked for quite a long time, actually. Um, and we're sort of connected, actually, the Yugambe people down the Gold Coast. Um, and I know also there's lots of Waka Waka people here um, in Brisbane also. Um, so I, I haven't done a paper or anything, but I've made some notes um, over the time. And some of it is um, to do with some things that I've already written. And I guess we all sooner or later at some point or another cannibalise our own work, you know, <laughs> to uh, get our points, various points across. So... Um, and I, I think it's wonderful, they, um, I'm sorry, what do you call it? It's attributes, Indigenous attributes? Graduate, Graduate attributes. 
Yes, that's that's wonderful because um, what the attributes are, I've often talked about that uh, in relation to relationalism and survivalism, relationalism and relationalist ethos and survivalism and the survivalist ethos and relationalism. I've talked about those attributes that come from from this, um, as I see it, um, that we have shared um, in being owners and runners of country for tens of thousands of years. And some of them are to do with, um, say, or being autonomous, autonomous beings, all of us, all human beings, they're autonomous, um, and the way of getting on with each other, both in the social and larger sense, uh, and modern too, uh, is autonomous regard and balance, as everybody is um, uh, kind of familiar with like gender balance, but balance in all kinds of different ways. Um, place, place is extremely important and this is the main part of education, uh, what I've got here, Indigenous teaching and learning, but to do generally with education. And the last one is ethics. Um, our idea of what ethics are, um, the the law, in other words, what we would um, traditionally have called and do still do call uh, in many places, the law, L-A-W plus L-O-R-E, you know, the law on one side, um, all the rules or ordering of society and the L-O-R-E, which is basically the story of how those rules came about actually. Uh, all both sides of the same coin of existence, you know, of life uh, itself. So if I could just start off, really, um, for for most Westerners, inquiry precedes place. Knowledge acquisition both defines and supersedes place. Supporters of the Western modern scientific method rejects claims of non-Western knowledges. The claim is that the structure and forces of the natural world remain the same in different times and in different contexts. Also, that this structure is knowable and that Western science has provided the ability to explain, predict and control many natural phenomena and to invent technologies to solve human problems. However, I've always thought that the, to the Aboriginal mindset, phenomena are received. And if there is an observation, it is to kind of like behold or regard, you know, regard. You know, uh, the law is both the creator, informer, and guide. The world reveals itself to us and to itself. We don't discover anything. Now, I learned a lot of this from my good friend and sister and colleague, Dr. Lilla Watson, whose uh, frame of reference was always uh, uh, always go by Aboriginal terms of reference in theorizing, in thinking. Always, always start from that. You know, not not to ignore, not to ignore Western terms of reference, but um, the beginning line, the underpinning is always Aboriginal terms of reference. So the Indigenous perspective argues that the West needs to overcome the biases of universalism in Western methods of inquiry and in the action of inquiry itself to promote multiple knowledge systems. And that would be wonderful in this, uh, uh, I'm sorry, but you said before, the, what you have there, the paper. Graduate. Yeah, graduate app attributes. Uh, Western contemporary techno sciences, rather than being taken as definitional of knowledge, rationality or object, objectivity, should be treated as varieties of knowledge systems. But even though knowledge systems may differ in their epistemologies, methodologies, logics, cognitive structures, or socioeconomic contexts, a characteristic they all share. Uh, is localness. So that's why place is so important in our, in our thinking. In other words, place precedes inquiry. Because if you have an inquiry or inquiry, it must be coming from an inquirer, you know, who has a place you know, and so on. So place defines and supersedes inquiry. Place is a living thing. Again, whether place is geographically located or an event in time, um, place doesn't hamper, confuse, or attenuate uh, inquiry, rather place both enhances and clarifies inquiry. Place underpins inquiry, but not ideologically so. If change is the fundamental nature of reality or existence, as described by um, old Greek philosopher Heraclitus, then place is the fundamental 
existential quantifier. That is to say, it's a place is a measuring device that informs us of where we are at any time, and therefore, at the same time, it's also informing us of who we are. So, for the indigenous, uh, and I'm this probably is for all indigenous, you know, everywhere, there is never a barrier between the mind and the creative. The whole repertoire of what's possible continually presents and uh, uh, or is expressed as an in, infinite uh, range of dreamings. And that's what we have, isn't it? What is possible, though, is the transformative dynamic of growth. So that's just to start off with. <laughs> um, but what I wanted to talk about and what I'm currently starting to... Um, Oh. oh, sorry. Oh, I see. Right. <laughs> Everybody is familiar with the uh, map, the language map. <laughs> oh. IT. Oh, there we are. Oh. Yes. There we are. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Yeah. Right. So just uh, further, some of the things that I, I'm um, I'm still working, I've been working on for quite a while, is um, a part of the things I do in my uh, talks and lectures and so on is, is talking about logics. Uh, and nobody has thought uh, for a long time that Indigenous people in general don't, don't have a logic, you know. Uh, only... Um, uh, old societies, starting probably uh, with the formal formalizing of logic, the Greeks, you know, Aristotle, he's the man who wrote the book, isn't he, uh, on logics. Um, and then later on, uh, there's a realization from exploration and that, that here's these other ancient old uh, civilizations, India, China, and so on. Um, they all had their own logic too. And so uh, the West had to look carefully at this. And then now in various modern, uh, at this time of, you know, modernity, uh, realising that Indigenous people have their own logic. And so that would be something else in the whole idea of teaching and learning that I would hope, really hope, that the understanding of this would come across in learning and teaching styles. And that's where we begin um, uh, understanding a whole lot of things about Western logic, but everybody else's logic too. And ours, of course, is based on this place here, <laughs> this country, uh, multiple places, uh, multiple dreamings. You, you could um, call it uh, genesis or uh, creative narratives, I suppose. Uh, but it's basically they're dreamings, hundreds and hundreds of them. Multiple, a dreaming is uh, to do with the law, L-A-W-L-O-R-E, multiple ones of those, and some of them overlap, as we know. Um, and the truth, um, the idea of the truth comes from, from this idea of, uh, where locality is. Um, so there's, there are multiple truths staring at us in this map, even though it's the white fellow's map. Um, you know, uh, it's, it, there's a reality about it with some things to be revised, of course, as they are being done at the moment, as we speak, actually. Um, so, uh, and a truth, the truth is not, and this is um, what always um, I thought was wonderful, is uh, is not an absolute truth, doesn't seem to be among us. So in other words, no absolutism, which is why our system isn't a religion really, but it has elements of religion um, because, you know, uh, absolutism is no offence meant, but it's a, because it's a religion, uh, a religious religiosity ha about it. It relies on faith, and faith is a kind of funny thing. It's um, reliable, and it's sometimes not reliable. It's weak. It's strong. It's uh, you found it, you lost it. You know, so very unreliable uh, as a as a way of you know thinking about existence and so on. Uh, because in our thinking, of course, there's hundreds of truths, literally hundreds of truths. And a truth is simply a perspective of the whole of existence 
uh, from a particular place, you know, perspectives. And the equation, the logic equation that comes out of that um, is that all perspectives are valid and reasonable. All perspectives, and we know among our own relations with um, people from other, other parts of the country, you know, you can't um, hold up your own way of thinking as against the other way of thinking. Because you, you say, not only is it bad manners, it doesn't make sense, <laughs> you know. So you can't think in that way. You, well, put it this way: you may think, but you wouldn't, you wouldn't sort of argue from that basis, you know, um, and so on. And the best thing about that, because uh, it fits in with our general custodial ethos um, and so on, uh, is that. Um, it, it allows for um, a softening or what would you say, a softening of judgmentalism, um, a suspension. That's right, you suspend judgmentalism and that's the logic that goes with the thinking. That's the, sorry, goes with the actual activity, the actual uh, uh, social order actually of not, um, for example, not having things like um, uh, which became very popular throughout the rest of the world. Um, no wars, of, no wars of conquest. Conflict, all right, but no wars of conquest. No idea of, you know, um, invading other people's country because you said you simply couldn't with that kind of logic and that kind of ontology. You know, you just simply couldn't. So, years and years, tens of thousands of years of stability. You know, coming from that. The other difference is um, that I would always hope, um, well, I, I should say, I should have said I'm a great believer in philosophy being taught in schools. I'm sure a lot of people do think that anyway. All schools, you know, private and state and so on. Um, and the philosophies are, would, should be, uh, of course, the Western philosophy, because there should be a background to teaching and learning and education in general and so on. So Western but also ours, of course, ours, and, and not just cross-cultural understanding, but more to do with our own idea, ontology and, and so on, you know, how we, how we see the existence, basically. But also I would even say, um, and this might and probably wouldn't go down well with some, some people in, uh, in government, um, I would say uh, some form of chi uh, Chinese or Asian logic uh, philosophy, like... The most well-known and famous one, of course, everybody knows, is uh, Confucianism, because of the uh, neighbourhood this this continent is in. The neighbourhood is Australasia, so better get to know your neighbours before too long, because Aboriginal people did actually, you know, we know Asians came and went and came and went, trading and so on and so on, and of course other cultures around. So uh, better to make friends then, you know, uh, get into all kinds of strife uh, about inter in, uh, international relations or global politics, you know, all that geopolitics, as they say. But yes, a conscience, um, and the thing with conscience and ethics, because I've done a paper on ethics uh, uh, and trying to uh, re re write uh, what, what I've been trying to work out for a long time, but um, I'm a bit, you know, how we're all a bit self-critical, <laughs> you know, you, nothing is ever good enough or something, um, for yourself, I mean. <laughs> um, but I realise there's a sort of a difference between ethics and conscience. There's actually a difference. They're not the same things at all. And I do believe that Aboriginal people knew this very well, knew this. The ethics is in the rules, but the conscience is, I always think of... Um, there's different organize, uh, different sorry meanings, different examples I should say of this meaning. Um, there was an old um, New South Wales um, what do you call uh, activist called called Mum Shirl. I don't know if that's very old, um, and she was a terror, you know, <laughs> to New South Wales pol politicians. <laughs> she would bail them up on the corner or on the steps of Parliament House or something, um, <laughs> and various things. Um, but uh, one thing she said, always stuck in my mind, she said, talking about 
early days of um, colonization. She said, if only, um, <clears throat> sorry, if only they had said uh, or could have let us know what what the what the problem is, what the situation is, that these are poor fellows being brought far away from around the other side of the world, being brought there, being treated cruelly, and so on. We we would have made, um, she said, we would have made room for them. You know what I mean? We would have talked about it and worked out some other area where they could be. You know, um, whether it was whether it was in the prisons or whatever it was at, in those early days, but something like this. But that, I thought, was, you know, it's, not, it's beyond ethics, it's a conscience. So to me, teaching both those things, uh, the underpinning of education, teaching and learning, that has to be the underpinning for, teach, for teaching and learning, ethics and a conscience, and, of course, the logic too. I think they're primary things. They're extremely important. Because um, because teaching and learning, education in general, it's about the future of the country, isn't it, really? Not just future generations, but the future of the country. What kind of a country do you want this to be? So you have to actually literally decide now what should be the underpinning of whatever kind of studies you're involved in or um, philosophy or ideas or career, you know, if we're talking about teaching and learning is to do with career and things like that. It's, um, I thought, to learn those sorts of things and not leave it just up to the individual, you know. Um, this is the other thing I was um, I was trying to get across in um, when I was re recently receiving that doctorate um, and you have to give a talk to, you know, about 400 students, got graduates, <laughs> you know, and all the academics behind and stuff. I thought you'd say something of advice and, that's one of the things that I was talking about was um, three things. Um, the the idea of short-termism and long-termism, um, the value of long-termism. And, of course, you couldn't get more longer-termism than Aboriginal people in this country, could you? you know, speaking from our perspectives and so on. Uh, but although short-termism is very important too, but too much modernity, uh, modernity has has relied on that so much for centuries and centuries. And as we quite often, other people point out, it gets faster, it accelerates, it's accelerating, accelerating all the time. And um, I think in terms of, um, trying to think of it in terms of light ways of thinking too, you know, the old cartoon with Daffy Duck, you know, he's being chased by Wiley Coyote or something. He's being chased and um, here we are, Homo sapiens, Homo sapiens on the edge of existential um, uh, fall, you know, uh, right on the edge of a cliff. And Daffy Duck comes zooming out, uh, being chased, and doesn't realise there's nothing underneath his feet. And, of course, you know, the music is all there too, and he drops straight down. That I always think that's short-termism thinking. It's a good example of short-termism. But, of course, short-termism is important right now with, you know, climate change and things like that. You, you can't have short uh, long-termism in thinking. So anyway, I said it much briefer than that. But the other one was um, about uh, moderating individualism. I think there is a bit too much of uh, almost like um, individualism, extreme individualism, atomism, do you know? The separating out, we're on our own, you know, the, the world is your oyster and so on, which is not good thinking, actually, I think myself um so moderate moderating individualism to slow down and to think a lot and to read a great deal young students i'm talking about um and the other one i said something rather ham-fisted i thought i didn't i wasn't thinking quick enough um but um or long long enough uh i thought there should be a kind of um insurance you should work out a kind of insurance. And I suppose these things, what I'm trying to say here, is uh, thinking about these things, um, thinking of the importance of these sorts of things in teaching and learning and education in general is a kind of insurance for the future of having a stable life, you know, 
having a stable society. A good friend of mine from Pulsus, Morgan Brick, he often described our, our old system, Aboriginal system. It's a long-term, very long-term experiment in human order making. That's exactly what it is, you know, human order making. So you have to think, in a sense, think big, very big and very deep in teaching and learning. That's the es essential thing I want to say, you know, no matter what you choose to do in the future. Yeah. Is that I'm sorry, is that oh. wrong enough? That was wrong enough. profound. <laughs> Gosh, you know, you kind of strapped yourself in to that, <laughs> Mary. Was it long um, enough, though? Was it? Per perfect. And oh. now our oh, sure. dear colleague, Professor Tracy Bunder, is going to facilitate some engagement from, from the audience. Thanks, Mary. Um, Thanks. Yeah, it was very profound. Can I just go over some of the, the key ideas? Um, that Mary raised for us to think about before um, I open it up to possibly some questions. Okay. So Mary gave us the following terms, relationalism, survivalism, autonomous human beings, balance, place, and the, and the importance of place being able to precede knowledge um, and ethics. Mm. She also talked to us about an Aboriginal terms of reference. And for those of you who don't know the story, um, in referencing Aunty Lilla mm. Watson, Aunty Lilla sat on University Council That's really good. And, and bought the Aboriginal terms of reference to the council mm. as um, a way of governance for the mm. university. Mm. And that would have been in the well, 80s. 80s. Yeah, in the, in the 80s. 80s. Um, Mary gave us really important um, thinking around what should be underpinning teaching and learning from an Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander perspective. Mm -hmm. So um, thinking about um, Indigenous logics, conscious um uh having a conscious conscience mm. and ethics and she sees this as being really really critical um and then she talked about short termism and long termism she talked about moderating extreme individualism mm. um i tend to agree mm. the advent of um the me me culture, me particular culture. on yeah. social media, particularly yeah. in here, Mary, I'm talking about our young ones. Mm, yeah. And maybe if we um, um, make the move into these ways of thinking, we're giving ourselves mm. an insurance mm. for human order making mm. That's right. and a different way of being, mm. particularly when we're looking at, in terms of short-termism, mm. the crisis that we have around climate. climate yeah. Um, mm. So what I'm going to do is ask people just to think if there's any questions that they would like to raise with Mary. I'll just give you a couple of seconds, mm. minutes, seconds. Yeah, one minute Good to up. think about it. <laughs> could could I just add thing to do with the place the idea of place? Um, I meant it in the sense of you all know um, an old French philosopher Descartes, yeah. Cartesian stuff. Um, uh, his idea, you know, is uh, what he said about I think, therefore I am. Mm. If we had something equivalent to that, it would be I am located, therefore I am. Mm. So via our mothers, mothers, um, people's country and our father's people's country. So both places you're anchored into, you're anchored, you know what I mean? So that's what I meant about place. Hi. Have we got a running mic or am I the runner? <laughs> don't expect no, me to be the runner. Don't. <laughs> Too old. Oh. 
Thank you. That was um, that was fascinating. I haven't heard like really good philosophy in in, in a while. So thanks so much for that. Um, I actually wanted to to sorry, uh, to ask for a clarification. Um, I'm really fascinated by this idea of place. Um, but I couldn't help but see a, a similarity between that and what you were talking about between the difference between ethics and conscience mm. and conscience being so much more fundamental to our experience mm. and I, I saw a parallel to conscience and place I'm wondering if I'm mm. mistaken or it, it, am I onto something there that these these concepts mm. are related or have I just drawn uh, I a wrongful uh no I think so correlation I think I think that's right um I'm still working it out myself <laughs> <laughs> so it'd be wonderful if somebody wants to take that up, kind of to you start writing about it too. Um, I'm, I suppose um, I'll re read a whole lot of stuff, you know, but one of the most profound actually for me was old Uncle Bill Niji. I don't know, you know, the story of feeling? The story of feeling. Um, and it's only a paperback, eh? You can buy it in a secondhand shop probably now, you know, but what he talked about that humans... Um, Feeling makes makes people human, actually. That's what he talks about. So we are not our brains, as the science kind of thing is, uh, but our feeling, that land, um, first of all, makes us human, make, makes us human, but with that, feeling comes with that, though, too. So the, play, the, the in a sense, the creator, but not a godlike creator, you know, nothing like a super, a super spirit or anything, um, the land itself, uh, teaches us conscience, feelings, conscience to have these feelings, feeling sorry for something, you know, for feeling uh, people, difficult decisions. You could call it a kind of um, uh, a sort of, um, what do you call it, um, a philosophy of Good Samaritanism, if you want to put an ism on the end of Good Samaritan. <laughs> do you know what I mean? You would normally just feel like that, you know, so you, you want to help. Um, like uh, I think, oh sorry, consciousness. Um, um, sorry, uh, conscience seems to be um, not in uh, place in um, that terrible place over there now in uh, Gaza. You know, that people are flat out looking for a conscience. You know, uh, with that. Um, but this is exactly where it should be make an appearance, and quite clear, crystal clear conscience. You know, because ethics can be um, um, in particular subjects, or you know, because you know uh, the ethics of a of a uh, not just a place, but um, oh, a university, um, a factory, um, a company, um, law, law, lawyers. Do you know what I mean? Ethics can be you know divided up. It doesn't mean to say that you have a conscience. Though. It's like the conscience is turned on all the time. Is a power. It's energy, actually, in a way. If you like, if you people don't like the word spirit or spirituality, like science, they haven't proved it yet. But um, you know, ninety nine percent of the whole world's population believes in some form of spirituality. So that outranks science, I think. <laughs> you know. Um, but yeah. So so working working on that feeling, place, conscience. They're they're. You know. Entangled, if you like. Yeah. There's a, a one liner thing I sometimes use um, uh, if we wanted to describe our system, our old system, traditional system, a sacralized ecological collaborative stewardship system. That's what it is, actually. So it's not a religion, it's not an ideology. If anybody speaks German here, there's a, a really good word for worldview called, um, oh, geez, isn't that awful? Um, it means worldview anyway. Zeitgeist? Uh, eh? Zeitgeist? No, no, Weltanschauung. That's it. A uh, Weltanschauung. Yeah. Uh, and it means worldview. So not just an opinion or just like uh, us looking outdoors there. Eh? Um, it's very deep, very deep. There's no, seemingly, no English equivalent of that kind of worldview. But um, it's not surprising in a way. It is in German. <laughs> uh, but I'm quite, I don't doubt that it would be in um, our um, Aboriginal people's uh, view and other old cultures too, because it does come from place, you know. Mm. So, yeah, that's, 
Is that is that answer? Um, I tend to ramble on a bit. Linda, did you have, Linda, did you have your hand up? No? No, up the back there. We just have time for one more question. Right up the back. Thank you, Dr. Norris. Um, it's right. a real privilege to be in your audience and to listen to your wisdom. So thank you so much. Oh, sure. I'll speak up. I'm just thanking you so much for sharing your wisdom with us. Um, given what you said about how place is one of the most important aspects of education, I'd really love to hear if you're willing to share what your dream is for the future of education on Turbal and Yugara country and mm -hmm. how it can embody the spiritual characteristics of this place at, at UQ? Um, not really, um, <laughs> because you'd have to ask the people, those people, the people here, you know what I mean? What they, they have all kinds of ideas about it too. You know, what what takes place, uh, what happens on your place? Do, do you know what I mean? So, and, and this is where this idea of um, a whole lot of different worldviews come into being. You know, so I could say something general like, uh, you know, philosophy should be really, really seen as really important in education in general from the beginning, you know, and I know that some schools do have it actually, but it's all, um, it's a choice, you know what I mean? If you've got a, you know, good principal who likes that idea and so on, but it, I, I think it should become really, you know, uh, what do they say? Manda mandatory, mandatory. Compulsory, yeah. Um, but um, so I know they do have particular ideas, but um, but yeah, I I I I think in a and it sounds like a almost a class thing, and I don't mean it like this, but to work out in the most basic way what being cultured means. Being cultured is not not to do with um, you know going to the concerts and ballet and blah, 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 all the class stuff. Um, but be, truly being cultured is being interested, open to other people's culture and other ideas. You know, that's that's what a, I believe a really cultured people and populace are, are like, you know, should be like. And younger people should be brought up to be like a cultured in that way, you know. Mm. Yeah. I don't know if that's Thank you. The answers. Thank you, Tracy, for facilitating that. Um, this what a good. wonderful. No, we've, no, no, we've, we've have, yes. Oh, oh good. I'm sorry. sorry. Yes, <laughs> we've we've got um, a, another wonderful panel to to follow you, Mary, um, and no doubt they'll bounce off your your significant challenges to us. You asked what kind of country we do we want to be. And I think that translates beautifully into us all asking ourselves, what kind of university mm. do we want to be? So what kind of university do we want to be? And if we hold that, I think, in our thinking throughout mm. the week, um, it will be a significant and generative discussion. We do have a gift for you. And... Um, it's got, you're going to need somebody to help carry it because oh, it's okay. significant. Oh, lovely. <laughs> oh, oh, very nice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, that's nice. But it's a very minor token yeah. for what yeah. is, as I've said, a, a profound opening to our, our week. Can you join me in thanking both our facilitator extraordinaire uh, and Dr. Graham? I feel like I'm extraordinaire. <laughs> <laughs> thank you thanks Rob. thank you thank you so much now you're going to to go. move away with some assistance and i'm going to introduce the next the next item so as we do that i'm going to hand over to professor blake mckinney known to many of you here um, associate dean academic of the faculty of health and behavioral sciences and Professor Barbara Massa, School of Psychology. Now, as you know, they are both um, University Teachers of the Year from 2019. They're going to co-facilitate the next session, which is 
teaching award winners teach the graduate attributes, okay? So teaching award winners teach the graduate attributes. And they have a star-studded panel that we're going to then hand over to. And just before Barbara and Blake do that, I'd like to also recognise that, that your leadership not only comes in a public way to the university through panels such as this, but behind the scenes, you do so much work around assisting the students and the directions of well-being, consent, et cetera. So I just, I just want to recognise publicly what a wonderful contribution you both have made and are making. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, Dean. Um, I think you've stolen most of what I wanted to say. Uh, so I'd also on behalf of the panel, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands in which we're meeting um, and note the significant history of learning on these lands and the privilege it is to be able to continue that today. So you might know Barbara and myself from the MOOC Crime 101 that we made with uh, Mark Horswell, where we filmed an eight-part crime drama um, and then based a course around that on campus as well back in 2014. Is that correct? Yes. Um, and everyone said it couldn't be done and it was crazy and they were correct. So today you're not here to hear about us, you're here to uh, hear from some of UQ's uh, best uh, award-winning teachers uh, about how they might engage students with the revised graduate attributes. Now you do have a handout uh, on your tables that lists the graduate attributes and what we'll be doing is inviting each one of them to uh, take you through their sort of approach to teaching and learning, maybe an activity that really emphasizes one of those graduate attributes, or in the case of Michael, two of those graduate attributes, because he likes to do uh, multiple things. Um, and in the interest of getting on with that, I'm gonna hand over to Barbara to introduce our first speaker. Thank you. Um, so it's my very great pleasure to introduce Professor Anne Black. Anne is a professor of law here at UQ, and her research and teaching is through a comparative law lens, teaching courses on Asian legal studies and Islam Islamic law for the final year electives, and foundations of the common law for postgraduate international students who need to understand how the Australian legal system works. Common to both is making sense of the varied ways of doing law in the world. Now, doing law differently means that her teaching brings in non-traditional, experiential and innovative modes of learning and assessment. And she was a recipient of the 2022 UQ Award for Teaching Excellence. Her teaching philosophy comes from Confucius, tell me and I forget, teach me and I may remember, involve me and I learn. The graduate attribute that Anne has selected is influential communicators. Now, one would think that this is a bread and butter attribute for future lawyers and for all UQ graduates, but how well do we do? Anne. In my courses in the law school, I always have an oral component and one would expect that for lawyers. And in this particular course this year, which is Islamic law, introduction to Islamic law, 50% of the assessment was for oral communication. So there was a two minute short presentation with a PowerPoint, one PowerPoint, similar to a 3MT, but a 2MT and a group work video report called Sharia in Five, and I'll tell you about those. The first thing I noticed, and this is why I wondered about being influential communicators, is quite a few of my students did that. They caught up their notes and read from them. Others did that. And you can see the difference in how you communicate. So to engage, you need to actually connect eyes down, the students have their heads down. She's engaging with her notes. They're not even looking at her. 
compared to this person who's charismatic, he's out there, he's talking to everyone. So you see it firsthand what influential communication requires. So what I did in this 2MT, it was oral, it was visual, and both had to communicate. So they had to do research, of course, behind it. They had to have a theme that demonstrated that research in an appropriate way. And there was a question and answer session at the end. They had to be able to respond to questions asked. And so we looked at all the usual things, clarity, cohesion, but engagement with the audience, enthusiasm was important. And also the poster had to be complementary. The visual impact had to enhance the presentation, not be separate from it. As well, I always put up a course gallery because students do a lot of work and it's a way of forming a, what I call a community of learners. They all know what the others are doing, even if they're in different streams, so they can look through them. Now, this should be easy for our future lawyers. They're going to be judges, they're going to be members of parliament, they're going to be on boards and et cetera. But I, they don't find it easy, which surprised me. Most of my students said, this was the very first time they'd had to speak in front of an audience in their final year because mooting's no longer compulsory. So you can graduate with a UQ law degree without ever having spoken in front of anyone because most of our assessment is written, either exams or assignments. And students found it difficult. Now, I know that it raises anxiety, and so I gave students the option of doing it and having it videoed and then shown to the class and then we did the Q&A and probably about 50% of our students chose that option. The other aspect that I did and I believe strongly in is group work because that involves intra-communication. Because our other forms of assessment, you write your assignment, I read it. You do your exam, I read it. And it's like that. But with these sorts of things, the whole class is learning from one another. So with this news report, it had a theme music so that they're all the same. Yeah. And the role of it is... Hello, to another episode of Sharia in Five. The aim of it is to highlight the diversity that exists in the Islamic world. And now I could lecture on that but it's way better to get the students to do it, to do it themselves, and then to link that to what sort of challenges and consequences that means for Australia's accommodation of Islamic law. I'm not sure what's happening. Okay, there it is. Um, so these news reports have to be accurate, have to be current, have to be engaging, succinct and had to have the media genre. Now, our students don't have that experience, so we had to build in a workshop with a journalist and a lawyer, and she's also studied Islamic law at Harvard, to um, scaffold and take the students through that experience. And as well, our students absolutely loathe group work. I know that people said they won't do your course if you have group work in it, but once they've done it, they actually come to like it and they realise that that's their future work environment, they're going to have to do it. So how did they do? Um, we had reports on nine countries, nine episodes, Albania, Afghanistan, Turkey, Indonesia, Iraq, Iran, Sudan, Somalia. And I'm going to give you an example of one from Lebanon. Thanks, Elena. Making headlines tonight, and it's been arrested in Lebanon today following the publication of a political cartoon on the artist's social media. The artist has been accused of breaching the prohibition against the publication of blasphemous content regarding religion and the publication of material that may provoke sectarian feuds. The Lebanese population is divided between Christians, Sunni Muslims, and Shia Muslims, and the government makeup reflects this division. Allegations of corruption against the Lebanese political elite and the financial sector have been gaining increasing volume in the past decade. So she used the visual aspect. She drew all of those cartoons herself. She used the visual act, um, component to accentuate the news message. 
And then she went, the video then went on to talk to the artist who'd been arrested from her point of view under the blasphemy laws and her lawyer gave the legal perspective on those laws. We then went to, they had a representative of a Sunni, a Christian and a Shia Muslim reflecting on these particular laws. And then they ended up by bringing it back to Australia with another news report on um, a Lebanese couple getting a divorce in Australia, one Sunni, one Shia, and the conflict over the divorce methods and custody of the children. So that was one example, and I'll give you another. This is on Indonesia. Tonight, we bring you to the Indonesian province of Aceh, where 23-year-old Cody Cooper Brown has fallen foul of the local Islamic law, or Sharia law. Cooper Brown was arrested after a wild night out with friends, where he breached local laws by consuming alcohol and spending time alone with his girlfriend. No, I just had a couple of beers on the beach. He just got out of here one night. And, uh, yeah, it's, you know, the laws are so strict, eh? Mr. Cooper Brown's arrest, as many Australians concerned, that was you. That's a very different law, especially given the, the Indonesian province of Bali is a popular party location. Our foreign correspondent, Sally Sunshine, brings you this special report to help educate and enlighten Australians on the Islamic laws with our northern neighbour, Indonesia. Many Australians only know Indonesia as a tropical party destination due to the popularity of Bali. However, Indonesia is also the largest Muslim-majority country in the world. So how did it come to be this way? So then they go through... Tonight, we bring you to... ...and tell us. So there's a little history of Islam coming to Indonesia and the Dutch colonisation, then some more on the regional variations between Aceh and other provinces. Then Cody's lawyer speaks about the actual criminal laws of Archie and what he's been charged with and the likely consequences. So how did it end? And as for Mr Cooper Brown, who's experienced a huge learning curve. You know, full respect to Indonesians and to... Uh, Sharia. Sharia law. <laughs> so they were able to use humour to make a fairly important point about how we react when we're in these countries. Okay, so I've shown you two examples of how I use oral um, communication, I guess, in part of my teaching and learning in this semester. I'm interested to know what you do in yours or what you could do in your courses going forward. So that's where we go to Padlet, isn't it? If everyone can jump on the Padlet, scan a QR code, uh, enter your responses into the Padlet. We'll put the Padlet on screen in a moment uh, and share responses with you. Make sure you get your responses on the Padlet. We've got a, a minute or so left. What are the things that you do to build in authentic communication in your courses? So already you can see one thing that people use is a conference uh, that has all the features of a regular conference, including conference coffee, I presume. Yep. Yep. And beers afterwards. Yep. Peer discussion or uh, that all peers get to access. All right, last chance to share your great ideas for communication. Is there more along? Dom, can we scroll sideways? Yep. There we go. Look at that. Some hidden gems here. Just 
Well, thank you everyone for sending in those. I'm going to go through them and who knows what I might be doing next year in my course. I might be adopting some of those. So thank you very much. And um, I'll hand over to our next speaker. I mean, thanking Anne. So our next speaker is uh, Dr. Miriam Mola, who is a senior lecturer in, in international business in the business school. Uh, Miriam prepares global human resources and international business management students to live and work internationally, both those coming into Australia and those heading overseas after graduation. Uh, Miriam teaches global human resource management and international human resource management and has received a number of awards like all of our speakers, including the 2023 Universitas 21 Award for Global Education and Student Support and a 2022 University Commendation for Outstanding Contributions to Student Learning. The graduate attribute that Miriam will be talking about is culturally capable graduates. I'll hand over to you, Miriam. Okay, thanks. thanks very much. Let's see, we can hear me? Yes, okay, wonderful. We're in business. Now we're just waiting on this thing. Okay. I sit with the, I, did, I didn't listen to my own introduction, although it sounded very nice. So I, I come from the business school, from the international business discipline, and I'm a teaching and research focused academic. And I'm really privileged to be here. A little bit scared too, <laughs> especially following Dr. Graham and um, Professor Anne just now. So let's see how we go. I've got 15 minutes and Blake and Barbara are going to keep me paced. I have a question. This isn't about me, this is about you. It's about all of us. As of today, right now, how many people live on this planet? Now, I don't want to know, and nobody Google this, okay? And if you know what the correct answer is, do not yell it out. I want uneducated guesses. And I have a marker here, and I'm about to put all of your answers on the board. So popcorn it out. Just yell it out. Time for you to participate, sir. What do you think? Seven billion. I take it. Okay. Here we go. Seven billion. You want to add any? Seven billion on the dot. Absolutely on the dot. Okay. What else? Deanne, don't leave me hanging. We'll add the 300 something, something 42. Okay, we'll go with that. We're running at um, one more, one more. Gemma. Oh, there we go. Six. Anyone else? 20 billion. I love it. You're my favorite person right now. Six, 20 billion. One more. Yell it. 8.6. Okay. So let's see. The somewhat correct answer is about 8.1 billion people. You see this. We went from 6 to 20. That's quite a broad range, isn't it? But we're at 8.1. As a matter of fact, let's just do the exercise here. It's 8 billion, 67 million, 677,179 as of this morning. I had to look it up. And we're about 68 of those. Okay? Now, I don't know about you. But I didn't understand that number. Okay, so we're going to have to dumb it down for me personally. If we took that 8 billion and shrunk it down to 100, so let's just pretend the world is made up of 100 villagers. How many people do you think would live in North America out of 100 people? Again, this is where you yell out. Out of 100, how many people populate North America? So it's Canada, USA, and Mexico. Off we go, Blake. No idea. <laughs> One, eight, great, five. eight, five, three. three, we're in the ballpark, it's five. Who said five? Wonderful, congratulations. How about the whole of uh, Latin America, which includes that South America plus the Caribbean? I need a number. 12. Eight, 12, 10, nine. Wonderful, we're on. Okay, let's finish this game. How about Europe? 10, 6, 4, 10. It's like you played this before. I don't know. Okay, and then there's Africa, which is that big blob of land in the middle that we all tend to ignore because we know nothing about it and we don't really care about it, right? Um, so how many people would live in Africa? 35. 35. 15. 15. 20. 16. Ballpark. Okay, how about Asia? We know that number is going to be higher. 
What did you say? In a... mm -hmm. 16. Now, what about Asia? And that includes a whole bunch of countries here. What are we looking at? We got it. It's got to be a 100 in the end. What was it? 50. Nobody dares to say anything. 60. So where is uh, where are math whizzes? I've already done the calculation, so I know what's left over for Australia. If the world was made up of 100 people, <laughs> less than one, we would end up right about here. We wouldn't even represent a complete person. Okay, how about that for a realization? Oh, by the way, again, out of 100, look at the list of languages that's being spoken. 12 would speak Mandarin primarily. Okay, six Spanish, five English, and the rest you can look up yourself here. But 63 people apparently speak a combination of, you know, 7,000 other languages and dialects and all that stuff. And that worries me because what we are looking at right now is the fact that our students, our graduates, are much more likely to interact with and work with people who don't live here but who live there. And people who speak as their primary language, Mandarin and Hin oh, sorry, Spanish, rather than English. I think we already knew that, but we needed to put it into perspective today to liven us up and to say, hey, this cultural capability graduate attribute is quite an important one, isn't it? And we kind of wake up every morning saying, yeah, maybe we'll do something about that one day. Maybe today's the day. Okay. Now, when I say our graduates are going to be working and interacting with people, I'm actually talking about global work arrangements. And there's three types, which I teach about in my global human resource management courses. The first one is global domestic work. We all do it right now. We stem from different cultures. We are co-located. We're working on something together, with it, which is UQ's strategies, right? Executing those strategies, teaching and learning strategy. Our students will have to do the same. In fact, they're already doing it. I'm just not sure they're doing it well enough yet. The other global work arrangement that we're dealing with, and it's kind of a friend or foe really, is that global virtual work component. We're doing it. We're asking our students to do it, but I'm not sure we're actually preparing our students to do it well. I'm not even sure I'm doing it well. How about that for an admission on tape? And then the last one is my favorite, if I can play favoritism here for a moment, international work relocations, where people physically get up, pack a suitcase, get on a plane, a train or a boat, and start living and working somewhere else. Our students will be doing that too, some of them. Okay. Our students will be doing probably a combination of it all. And I wonder if they're going to be ready for it when they walk across that graduation stage with their UQ passport, not sure yet. I think that's an okay place to start. So if it's not obvious yet, I'm talking about the culturally capable graduate attribute. And that involves a number of things. If you haven't had a look yet, let me guide us through over the next 25 seconds here. What UQ has committed to and is committing to over the next years is to say, hey, we're going to develop graduates who not only have a thorough understanding of our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, peoples and cultures, which is immensely important. Okay? But we're also going to lend an eye and part of our brain to the rest of the world, that appreciation for different national cultures, as well as societal diversity. I'm not speaking about the, you know societal diversity today. I'm talking about national culture specifically. And we're going to do that in a number of ways. The way that I'm speaking about today is how to sensitize students to cultural differences, perhaps even how to sensitize ourselves to different cultural challenges. Okay, so I think this is a really good time. I can't read that, Blake. What does it say? Excellent. This is a really good time <clears throat> to stop and say, okay, well, what does all this mean and where do we even start? I think we need to start by reflecting on what we already do. But I'm actually not that concerned about reflecting on what we already do because we could all go home and pull out a piece of paper and say, let's just list all the things I'm doing that I could tell the university that lead me to developing culturally capable graduates, right? We could all come up with something. We could all be proud of that. What I'm looking for is for us to think about our next step, or our next steps. 
So one of the questions that I have for us all is, what is in fact this collection that perhaps already exists at UQ that says, these are our global learning experiences and every student can tap into these, whether it's study abroad, whether it's through our global partnerships, whether it's in our classroom, what is it? And where does this pool of knowledge lie? I'm afraid it's quite dispersed, okay? So right now it lies within each and every one of us. So we are going to have to take stock at some point, whether it's us as individuals or us as a university or us as a school, as a faculty. And we might as well be the people who take charge in that, okay? So quick exercise because I'm getting the five minute, let's go Miriam. Uh, in front of you, you have suitcases, mini suitcases. So everybody quickly grab one, okay? Grab us, it's supposed to be a suit. So let's just pretend it's a suitcase, okay? Happy traveling. No, there's no ticket to Bali or Honolulu in there. I'm sorry, but open it up. Within it, you will find, first of all, a snack because we all need a snack when we travel. So enjoy that. The other thing you will find is a pencil and a piece of a note card. It's blank. Take it out. And what I'm going to ask us all to do uh, very briefly is to take that pencil, put it in our hand, ready to write, and lift your hand up. I want to see the pencils in your hand. Fabulous. I see we have some left. Not everybody's ready yet. D don't worry about the gummy bears. They'll be there when we finish. Okay. <laughs> Pencils, fab fabulous. Now, some left-handed people, great. Now, what I need you to do is take that pencil and put it into the other hand, please. Come on, come on. Now, no cheating. You're going to keep that pencil in that hand. And what I'm going to ask you to do on the ready, set, go is I'm going to ask you to write with your non-dominant hand, please, your first name, your last name, your faculty and institute, and your favorite holiday destination on that sheet of paper. Ready, set, 30 seconds. Thirty seconds. We're down to twenty now. Ten questions later. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, pencils down. Exams over. Let's stop. Please exchange your note card with the person sitting next to you. Let's see if they know who you are. Can you read who's sitting next to you? Oh, gee, that's that's terrific. I don't know. Hey, that's that's way too good. I thought this might happen. All right. So, in the interest of time, could I get your attention, please? Again, one of those opportunities to yell words at me. How does speaking of feelings, Dr. Graham said earlier this morning, feelings are what make us human. So let's be human here. How do we feel about this little exercise? How does this make you feel? Adjectives. Pardon me? Stressed. Stressed. I'm going to have to put that on the wall before I forget. Okay, yell, continue to yell it out. Stress. What else? Frustrated. What else? Excited. Nah. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> of course. What else? Yeah. Pardon me? Down. Upside down. What else? Strength. Yeah, me too. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> one more. Yes. Uncomfortable. And there was one more? Wrong footed, uncomfortable. We'll stop there. Uncomfortable and wrong footed. Okay, I have to forgive my, um, my handwriting. Absolutely, I loved all the answers. Now, do you think that that's perhaps, you know, this, this lineup of words, uncomfortable, stressed, frustrated, do you think that's how, let's say, our international students feel when they get off the airplane, step into our classrooms, and we expect them to do these amazing things? Like, it's, it's easy, can't you just do it? Do you think that's how our international and domestic students feel when we pair them up in teams and say, work together? Do you think that's how our graduates will feel when they embark and work with people from Nairobi and Rabat and Vancouver and Rome? And they're like, well, I thought I graduated from a top 50 university, but apparently I don't know how to work with anybody. Anne and I have a lot in common. You call it Chinese proverb. I also see it as a Ben Franklin quote. Tell me, I'll forget. Show me, I may remember. Involve me and I will understand. We need our students to understand what they may not know is relevant to them. Something I do in my classroom each year, no fail, 
is I dedicate three hours to playing cards. Okay, that's what you see in front of you here. I invite students in, they don't need to prepare a thing, they just need to sit down, read the instructions and play a game. What they do not know is that in front of them are 10 different versions of that game. It's African card game, it goes way, way, way back. And they play this game actually in silence. Imagine, it's quite eerie. And they realize, quickly realize that even the tiniest differences in rules can cause great, great grievances to them. They could be two Chinese playing two Chinese. They think they're the same, they're similar, they'll all get along, trust me, nobody ever gets along in that game, right? And it brings out the question about, well, do we really know who we are, not culturally speaking and beyond? And the answer is, I think we have a lot of work to do here. So with my 30 seconds left to go, I want us to all take away something here beyond a pack of gummy bears. I can't make you do anything about this culturally capable attribute, not a thing. You can walk out of here and say, well, that was nice, got a bag of gummy bears, but I won't, I won't touch that anymore. But think about how much is out there that can motivate us. If it's not our own experiences, right? Maybe it's our national strategy on international education. Imagine, did, who, who knew that there's a national strategy on international education? that supposedly will take us all the way to 2030. It's not that in-depth of a document, read it, it's hyperlinked. Our UQ strategy certainly has lots to offer and it doesn't start and stop with me. Everywhere I look, our colleagues, our academic and professional colleagues have so much to give. But again, the, the pool of wealth, right? The pool of knowledge in this space is so dispersed that it's time to put together a cohesive effort and now is as good of a time as any. Okay, there we go. Thanks very much. See, you always blame the technology. Okay, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Michael Tai. Uh, Michael is from the School of Psychology uh, and he's a uh, teaches social and organizational psychology and also uh, research methods and statistics. He's received such a long list of awards that I don't actually have time to go through them all. Um, but I will just name a few of them, which are the UQ Citation for Outstanding Contributions to Student Learning, a UQ Award for Teaching Excellence, and uh, AAUT, AAUT Citation for Outstanding Contributions to Student Learning. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Michael Tai. Oh, and I would say I knew I knew I'd stuff up. <laughs> Graduate attributes. So he's doing two. So it's a bonus. We get two for the price of one. Uh, it's going to be talking about respectful leaders and connected citizens. Thank you. Thank you so much, Barbara. Is this is everyone hearing this? Yeah. Beautiful. How are we feeling? Gummy bears. <laughs> all right. So uh, first of all, I'd just like to take a moment to again acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we are convened here today. I'd like to pay my respects to their ancestors and descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country, and I recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. And today, what I'm going to be doing is talking about something called identity leadership. And just a little bit about my teaching philosophy. I have been guided by this approach of groupiness, uh, by usness. What I really hope to do in my own courses, and what I hope you do in your courses as well, is facilitate this sense of connection and belonging between my students. And this is uh, just some students who organized a musical performance for me uh, just, just randomly at the end of semester. Uh, and we have a great time each semester. I'm going to hopefully communicate the value of building and fostering this sense of cohesion in your courses every time you teach. And this is something that I think really speaks to two of the graduate attributes uh, that we are learning about in this session. And those are, you know, having students realize that they are connected citizens in this world and building their leadership capacities, right? So that they become respectful leaders. And I'm driven personally by uh, social identity theory that's what my research uh, is based off, and that's also what my teaching philosophy is based off. The idea that we as individuals, 
right, going through society, uh, our self-concepts are actually really inherently tied to the groups that we belong to, right? We are naturally connected citizens. And to allow students to understand that is to allow them to grow as people, as individuals, and as uh, contr contributors to society. And now when we think of groups, we can think of really proximal units like families, friends, right? We can think of the groups that we work with, right? Uh, at work, uh, at university. We can think of hobbyist groups, but we can also think of these broader cultural and demographic groups uh, that we are a part of. Now, we don't really identify with all of these groups to the same degree, right, to the same extent, right? There are core groups, right, the groups that we very strongly identify with. There are intermediate groups that we sort of identify with, but not as strongly, and also peripheral groups that we are a part of, but we only identify weakly with, all right? So, for example, for me, board games, very important part of my identity, and so I just depict one there, but I'm a part of multiple board games groups. Uh, I also enjoy bouldering, but it's not as important to my identity. And I'm on school committees. Uh, and even though I'm on these committees, right, uh, they're not really an integral part of how I see myself. Okay, so what I want you to do for the next, let's say, two to three minutes is you've got a worksheet on your table, one for each of you. I want you to spend the next two to three minutes plotting out your social identities or the groups that you belong to in these three sections or three zones on your worksheet. So I'll give you a bit of time to do that before we move on. All right, so I feel that uh, you've had enough time to list a few things down on your worksheets. And so I want to uh, just state that this is not just random, right? The degree to which we identify with each of these groups is incredibly important, right? And it's important for multiple reasons, but I hope to demonstrate this uh, with an experiment. So if you could access uh, the survey, that I have online and complete that. And hopefully this will allow me to show off a program that I've been working on uh, developing over the uh, past year or so. I want you to answer the question that comes up. So I'll wait till people are no longer following that link before moving on. All right, so I think most people have been able to access the experiment. And let me just explain to you what that experiment was all about, right? So in this experiment, you were randomly assigned to one of two conditions. Okay, so in the low identification condition, you were asked to choose one group that you weakly identify with or a group that's in your peripheral zone. And in the high identification condition, those of you assigned to that one were asked to choose one group that you strongly identify with, right? The group, uh, one of the groups in your core zone. And everyone was asked the same question, right? How much time, effort and energy would you be willing to put in for this group? Right, so you'll be able to see what the results show on your phones, but could I get the results to show on the screen? Oh, no, that's me. <laughs> what we see here, and I'm going to sound like a huge stats nerd, uh, is that we have a significant difference between those groups in how happy you are or how willing you are to engage with the group and contribute to the group, right? We see the p-value is very, very low, which means that the difference between these two means is statistically significant. So what you can see there, if we go back to uh, the slide, is that identification is a group or with a group is incredibly important first of all in 
engaging and motivating people. The more people identify with the group, the more engaged they are, the more motivated they are to contribute to the group. But that's not where it ends, right? So the research shows that identification has a large range of positive outcomes. All right, the more strongly you identify, the more you cooperate and the more willing you are to collaborate within that group, All right? The more open to influence you are, the more you're likely to adopt norms and values. And it also has positive benefits when it comes to our psychosocial well-being, right? A sense of belonging people can derive from the groups that they highly identify with, right? They feel greater meaning and purpose. And it also has effects on health and well-being. Okay, so hopefully you can see that identification with the groups around us is incredibly important. And now this is something that is not novel new information. In fact, uh, work coming out of uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander thinkers and researchers uh, has also shown that identification is incredibly important, right, for the social and emotional well-being. So professors uh, Graham G and his colleagues have uh, come up with this framework to understand uh, social and emotional well-being in Abor Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples uh, that includes connection, right? Seven types of connection as important for people's psychosocial function. Connection to country and land, connection to culture, connection to community, connection to family and kinship, right? So what we're seeing here is that this concept of connection, this concept of identification is incredibly important. We as teachers are in a position to leverage this understanding, right? When it comes to the course identity, the student identity within our courses, because if we ask people, if we ask students to map their course or student identity, they can map them here. But what we really want them to do is map them here right, core groups that they highly, they strongly identify with, given those benefits of identification, right? So how do we do that? Well, we engage in something called identity leadership, all right? And it's this very uh, new age conceptualization of leadership that is less about me as a leader, but us as a group, all right, so it's this idea that effective leadership centers on a leader's understanding of share group memberships that they have with others. And leaders who can leverage this sense of us and we have the greatest influence and inspire the most in the people who see them as leaders. And how exactly do you practice identity leadership? Well, there are four dimensions of identity leadership that facilitate a sense of us and increase identification with whatever group you are a part of. Right, so the first is identity entrepreneurship, and this is where you craft a sense of us. You include people in that group. You make sure that they feel like they belong, right? You identify and define shared values, norms, and ideals. But not only do you foster this sense of groupiness, identity prototypicality means that you as a leader have to be seen as just another member of your group. Okay, you have to model the core attributes of the group so that people who see you as a leader can follow that modeling. Identity advancement is doing it for us. In a position of leadership, you should advance shared interests of your group, right? You should prioritize and help address your group's needs. And identity impresarioship is making us matter, right? Facilitating collaboration and connection between group members by bringing them together through structures, activities, and events. Okay, so for the next however much time we have left, one minute, right? If you could access this uh, Padlet, and I want you to think about yourself as teachers in a learning and education context, how you can practice these identity leadership uh, dimensions or these processes in order to increase student, ident uh, student identification in your courses and therefore student out outcomes, right? Don't need to record them on the paddle if you don't want to, uh, but at least have a short discussion uh, in your tables. Thank you.
Uh, thank you, everyone, for engaging in this uh, discussion on your tables and to some people for engaging with the Padlet as well. Uh, what you can see here is that, uh, yeah, so, so many awesome suggestions, right, creating spaces and places uh, for students to uh, engage with one another, right, and to describe new emerging identities. And hopefully you can see that these practices are not only addressing, that can not only address identity entrepreneurship, but creating spaces and places may also address identity empresarioship and such as well, right? Defining us in our space. Visibility matters, right? If this is about representation, ensuring that, you know, we have lecturers who reflect the diversity of our students, because that's an issue, right? Right? Faculty diversity, right? Engaging in advocacy, working on behalf of the group to achieve recognition and reward for the group. Okay, so when we've got events uh, under identity empresarioship, organizing events for our students, right? Uh, to to help them engage in this groupiness and live out their group memberships. Uh, so I just like to thank you so much for engaging in this and hopefully, you know, um, we can share this link around and people can continue adding to it so that everyone has a resource for how to engage in identity leadership in their own courses. And uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. All right, and that brings us to our uh, final presenter, uh, last but definitely not least, uh, Dr. Linda Chevalier. Linda's a teaching-focused senior lecturer in the School of Social Science and also, because she's not busy enough, a deputy ADA for the Haas faculty and an Italy principal practitioner for Sense of Belonging and a HEA fellow. Uh, she teaches courses in sociology and social science uh, in areas like social inequality and community development. She's been recognised for her excellent teaching through a number of awards, a Faculty Early Career Award for Teaching Excellence, a University of Queensland Award for Teaching Excellence in 2019, and an AAUT Citation for Outstanding Contributions to Student Learning in 2019 as well. Um, and so I'd like to invite Linda up to uh, talk about the graduate attribute of courageous thinkers. Do I have a little pointy thing that I can use? Oh. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've, thank you, everyone. Lovely to be here. I put up this picture because I thought I'd do the right thing and get the UQ definition of courageous thinking, and I forgot to put in UQ, and it gave me Richard Branson. So, um, and, and for all I know, if you work for business uh, and, um, I don't know, uh, multinational venture capitalist conglomerates, this is courageous thinking. But I thought it was useful to put up because it's a reminder that no matter what you're working in, what discipline you're in, we all need to define these attributes for ourselves. This may indeed be a very good example of courageous thinking for business. I'd need to talk to my business colleagues about that. But I'll, so all I can do is talk about what it means in terms of social science and where I'm located. But the broader UQ definition is here that we want graduates to have the ability to critically question, analyze, interpret, and evaluate their world and experiences to conceive innovative responses to future challenges. They will draw on their courage and creativity to test, debate and shape new ideas, understandings, approaches and opinions. So let's work with that. Can I ask you just to take 30 seconds in your tables and answer this question? What's the biggest challenge facing our current students? Okay, so I'm not going to demand that you share that right now. I've got a feeling time's not in our favour, but I want to talk about my context. And for me, the biggest challenges that my students face are loss of hope, hopelessness. And that manifests in two ways. One, it manifests as extraordinary anxiety uh, where they're unable to perform or even think about the future. They're so overwhelmed. Or alternatively, an incredible bitterness and despair. And so that's what I see in my classroom. You may have a bit, very different cohort, 
but that's the challenge for me is how do I assist young people who have, and they're mainly young people who have this kind of experience. And I teach, as Blake said, in areas of social inequality. So we spend 13 weeks talking about how terrible the world is. 13 weeks talking about inequality, how to measure it, how to identify it, its impacts, racism, ableism, sexism, we go through the lot. And we do that at a global level. But my question is, how can I do that differently? What does it mean to be a courageous thinker in that space? And for me, what I'm really trying to do is think about how do we create hopeful thinkers? So to me, a hopeful thinker is, sorry, a courageous thinker is someone who's hopeful because to be hopeful means to stand up against the dominant systems that are currently working against wherever you may be standing. So to do that, I have a framework that comes out of Ingrid Burkett, who is an ex-UQ lecturer and one I'm still quoting. And she talks about we, how we might do hope through having different frames of engagement, how we frame the world. And so what I want to do is share with students that accepting or being a victim to our current system is actually a choice. And sometimes it's an absolutely natural choice, but it's only one of five choices that we can make. And in fact, we have the ability to stand in very different frames of engagement that will alter the way we see the world and act in the world. Uh, so these frames look like this. First of all is acceptance, that we see the system for what it is and we believe it and it's all good. We have shiny teeth and healthy hair and we are just loving the joy of learning in that moment. The alternative frame is victimization, where we basically assume ourselves to be a victim of something. Now, the great thing about victimization is you can be a victim of absolutely anyone or anything. Okay, so I could stand here and say, it's so unfair, the university promotion system doesn't work in my favour because I'm teaching focused, or I could say I'm a victim of the university because my workload is unsustainable, or I'm a victim of the university because tertiary education isn't valued in the country, I can go on. So this is a really easy place to be, and it's often where people will land. And I think it's important to wallow here. I've done a lot of wallowing in my life, I recommend it. So you can stay in this space for a little while and wallow, but the point is it won't create change. Do you like that little UQ flip there? <laughs> okay, so what we want is an alternative framework of something other than just accepting or being a victim. And they look like this. The first one is engagement. We can actually engage with a system. So, and the great thing is it works for students or staff. So as students, I talk about how they can whether it's have a say, join a student staff partnership, whether it's get involved in clubs or societies. And this speaks very much to what Michael was talking about in terms of how do we build identity. So being engaged is one of the ways we build identity, whether we join the HEA circle, whether you know we join working parties. These are the things we do to try and change the system from inside. Secondly, we can oppose it. We can go on strike, we can march, we can carry placards, we can rally. And I've also done a lot of this and recommend it totally. The alternative is we can create. We can create an alternative system, what we call a parallel system. And often um, these are systems that are small scale. So we're not looking to take over the world. What we're looking to do is demonstrate that something else is possible. So if I think about the food system, for example, a lot of people create alternative food systems or their own sustain sustainable systems. In university, this is one example, the Brisbane Free University. I don't know if any of you know about this. So it's a group of people who run a university in car parks and public buildings in Brisbane. Uh, and they basically have set up a system whereby they have no money uh, and the people just come and share their knowledge. They might be philosophy graduates sharing their knowledge of philosophy or food systems thinkers thinking about food systems. Um, there's no accreditation, so it's very much about learning. But the point is, this is an alternative structure. Many of my colleagues have actually left the uni and set themselves up as cooperatives and run workshops and run alternative education processes, um, and good luck to them. Uh, so the idea that we can actually just try and create something different. Um, what I'm going to do is invite you now in tables of five. I've set up some victim statements. Uh, Barbara and Blake were a bit worried that I was going to be too grim, given the nature of what I, I teach. So I've, I've come up with some alternative problems that are really weighing heavily on us. And I'm asking you to think about how you might respond to these in three active frames, either to engage with them, 
either to oppose them or what you might create as a parallel system. Okay, and we're just going to spend a few minutes talking about them. So I've come up with these ones, but you're welcome to substitute your own. So it might be I struggle with the lack of oat milk in my latte at the local cafe. Uh, maybe it's Brisbane's tap water tasting terrible. I end up dehydrated and I get a headache. It could be I hate the way when shopping at Aldi, there's so much pressure to get groceries unloaded. Um, maybe it's this one here. The official university polo shirt design makes my hips look big. And it makes me really reluctant to volunteer and be an active citizen. Um, compulsory end of semester student evaluations of teachers and courses are highly traumatic and lead me to overeating and abusing alcohol. And I blame the university for my weight gain, addiction issues and financial woes. So find a victim statement that you feel comfortable standing in for a little while that you, it resonates. And I'm just going to ask you to spend a few minutes thinking about how might you create change in that system at your cafe with UQ marketing, wherever it might be in terms of engagement or opposition or creation. Is this working? Yeah. Um, we're all the victim, wait, wait, except Luke, all, all the females here are victims of um, air conditioning. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we're in the, I'm in the Gordon Greenwood building on level five. Gordon Greenwood, I don't know, it was designed by someone in the fifties who thought that, um, air conditioning needs were just, I don't know, secondary to everything else and that it was fine to have a building completely lined in windows with internal offices that were all cooled in the same way as the ones with the windows. And anyway, we've, I actually, so my, um, I got a, a temperature gauge thermometer and I was keeping track and had a log book um, of my temperature. And then when I uh, contacted health and safety and I showed them that my stats were that my office is 14 degrees, um, then they came with their, to, the, I sought external validation and they came with this thermometer thingy, this radar thing, and came in at different times of the day to externally validate my log bookkeeping of my thermometer and then admitted that I was correct. Um, which was very validating and was very hope inducing. That was that was false. They then told me they can't do anything about it and suggested that I get scarves. So it has now gotten to the point where we've embraced this as a culture on level five in the Gordon Greenwood building. And I'm frequently gifted scarves and people gift, I gift people scarves. And we have now got a culture of scarf wearing and gifting and level five at the Gordon Greenwood building. Thank you. I, I'm not quite sure which one. Well, I guess it fits into opposition and then, yeah. then co-creation of an alternative system. Yes, beautiful. The culture starts. <laughs> <laughs> beautiful. Thank you. Um, yeah, so we, we went with number seven. The uh, polo shirt makes my hips and gut look too big. Um, so for engagement, we thought we could stretch it over a, shirt, a, a chair. Um, for opposition, we could print out a protest letter and pin it to the back and the front of the shirt. Nice. And for create, we could make our own fantastic polo shirt design. Excellent. Thank you, Chris. Perfect. Thanks, Chris. Uh, one more. Any other issues that were discussed? Didn't resonate? Okay. Thanks, Sam. So for opposition, um, we thought we would cancel all classes or we would sit outside in the sun. <laughs> okay. Very nice. Thank but you. our creativity one was fairly similar. Excellent. Thank you so much. Okay. So my point is, obviously, when I'm talking with my students, I'm dealing with slightly more significant issues. We're talking about unemployment and housing and uh, crisis of the economy, uh, climate change, but the systems are still the same. It's still dealing with systems. So how do we assist students to move from hopelessness to acknowledging their own agency and even more important, acknowledging their privilege? So I don't care what inequality students have to deal with. The fact that they're here at UQ means they are also standing in spaces of privilege. So how do we get them to work from that? Because the thinking of people like Kathy Jenny is that the more privilege we have, the greater our moral imperative is to act against oppressive systems. So that's what I think courageous thinking means in the social science. I'll leave it to you to decide whether it 
it means something else. Um, and I wish you all glittery unicorns. <laughs> Thanks very much, Linda. Uh, and just thanks again to all of our presenters today for uh, sharing your teaching practices with us. What we would like to do before going out to the deck for lunch is uh, in the warmth, so uh, we will change the system, is just uh, take a minute just to hear from you. What is it that uh, you've learned today that would change what you do in the classroom if you're teaching the classroom, either in terms of uh, some of the examples and the content of what you learned about today, or even the way um, we saw today, you know, people talking about their teaching practice. So, you know, the form or the content. So if you could just um, stick your hand up and we'll get the mic to you would anyone like to share what was the, the thing that was either most surprising uh, or that would inform what you do in the classroom there's got to be some good ideas and you can't complain about students not willing to contribute if you're not going to put your hands up thank you Pick on people. right okay he's looking really nervous julie <laughs> didn't think I looked that nervous, Barbara. Um, no, well, I guess what I learned is that we have to be courageous in thinking creatively about how we work with the graduate attributes. I'm always struck with how it has to be fit for purpose. And so I really liked the, the various disciplinary lenses that are put on this, but adapting the attribute in a way that speaks to what it is we're trying to teach, whether it is in international uh, business or whether it is in law or whether it is in psychology, how do you then make that work so the students see the graduate attribute as part and parcel of the, the discipline or the content that they're here to study? Thank you. Okay, I'm going to keep going. Anyone here? No, no, no. Oh, come on. Oh, there's a volunteer. I'll come and stand behind you. Yes. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm interested, I guess, feedback um, by the way that I think some of the attributes are connected, um, but um, a little unhappy, I guess, would be a gentle way of saying my really deeply felt unhappiness <laughs> um, about the fact that um, the culturally capable one really got taken up um, in a way that I had never envisaged and um, and that actually the rest of our conversation then followed on is whereas I think we um, when designing the attributes actually saw um, lecturers engagement with um, students ought to have implicit to it engagement around uh, Indigenous knowledges and Indigenous people of the world and more specifically those in Australia. And yet we had that whole conversation with no connection to Indigenous Australians at all. And so if the speakers felt like they lost this table, my sense is perhaps that is is potentially why you lost this table a, a attention a little bit um, because I think um, we deserve also to be respected as international citizens. You know, we res we deserve to be respected in, in the multiplicity of ways that you teach about Australia and the way that we do things in Australia because so much is constructed by um, the knowledges and experiences of Indigenous people. And if you don't have much of a sense of that or you're not active in that quite as yet, then I think imagine going to New Zealand and the way that you have to there as an Australian it deal with Maori languages, et cetera. Um, we're, we're the same here. We're just not necessarily taught to read it that way, you know. So all of the language names that are place names, you know, which I think we started the day with, with Aunty Mary, are absolutely naming for you, you know, and yet we've we've had this whole conversation. And and so you wonder why, you know, Tracy and I and Susan look so grey. This is why, because we sit and we witness a, 
a, a conversation again that starts by naming us and placing us, giving us really good structures for how to, to run those conversations. And then we have a conversation that had none of it. Thank you, thank you for that feedback. Um, absolutely hear that. Um, okay, any last contributions? So I think we're out of time. Now, Dom has put up a QR code. This is not another Padlet, it's a request for feedback. So if you've got um, uh, feedback for us about uh, your experience in the session, we'd love to hear it. Otherwise, I would like to uh, invite you to join us for lunch on the deck. Thank you.